guys can go on out to Children's Church and yeah. Okay, well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Hope Community Fellowship and thank you for choosing to come and worship us this morning. And if this is your first time with us, again, welcome. We're glad that you're here. And if it's not your first time with us, well, welcome back. Um, so today we're going to be studying the parable of the ten minas, or minas, whichever one you want, or whichever one, I, I say them both, by the way, uh, which that's recorded in Luke's gospel in chapters 19, in chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. So if you would, please join me there in your Bible. So this is the 20th parable that we've studied since we began this series on the parables that Jesus told. So Jesus uses people's earthly experiences to help them, to help those who are seeking to understand the spiritual principles that he's teaching. So Jesus told these parables as he ministered throughout the Galilean region, which is where he and most of his disciples were from. And he also told some of them during his final journey down to Jerusalem. And during that extended trip down to Jerusalem, he told his disciples on three different occasions that he was going to Jerusalem to die. Yet somehow they never got it. They never understood him. So on the road, just before arriving at Jericho, which is where we're going to be at today, that's the city where he told this parable at today. Listen, by the way, Jericho was the last town before you would get to Jerusalem. As you were walking to Jerusalem from the northern region, Jericho was going to be your last stop before you got to Jerusalem. So Jesus, they're, they're at the last stop that they're going to make before they get in there. Listen to what he says to his apostles. In Luke 18, verses 31 through 34, Jesus says, So we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what, he was, what was said. So this passage is going to be key for today in helping us understand why Jesus told this parable that we're going to take a look at today. So here's what I'm asking you. I'm asking you all, don't forget what this passage just told you. This was Jesus's third time explaining to them he's going to Jerusalem to die, yet they still don't get it and they don't understand it. So between what he just told them there in our parable today, Jesus arrives at Jericho and, and when he arrives at Jericho, the first thing he does is he he heals a blind man. And then as he's, as he's walking through Jericho, Jesus encounters a man named Zacchaeus who places his faith in Jesus that very day. And Jesus says that he received salvation that day. And that's where we're going to pick up our story after he's just been at Zacchaeus' house. Listen to what verse 11 says. It kind of gives us an introduction to the parable. And this is what verse 11 reads. It says, As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable, because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So Jesus tells this parable either at Zacchaeus' house, or immediately after they left when they get on the road heading toward Jerusalem, the author, Luke, doesn't really explain where he tells his parable at, but it's immediately after they had finished at Zacchaeus' house. And he says there, as they heard these things, indicating that, you know, because of the things that they had heard, which, by the way, the things that they had heard were not all from Jesus. They were hearing other things as well. But because of the things they heard, they all believed 
that the kingdom of God was going to appear when Jesus got to Jerusalem. So this indicates that those people who are following him, I mean, they're kind of following along to go see it, to see this kingdom of God appear when Jesus gets to Jerusalem. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Christ, that he was God's chosen one. But the problem is, is they erroneously believed that when he got to Jerusalem, that he was going to establish this kingdom on earth right then and that he would defeat Rome and expel them from the homeland and, and all that other stuff. But their presuppositions focused on a physical kingdom in this world and not on a spiritual kingdom in heaven. And at this point, by the way, I, I want to remind you and bring that verse back to you that we had just studied up in the beginning where Jesus plainly told them, when I get to Jerusalem, they are going to kill me. So how they thought that he was going to establish the kingdom of God at that point, I have no idea because he was pretty clear three times, they're going to kill me when, they get, when we get there. Again, his disciples, even the 12 that he chose, they have no comprehension that Jesus is less than a week from being crucified and dying on that cross. So he tells them this parable that we're going to read today to help them make the connection that, hey, I'm going away, but while I am gone, I expect you, my disciples, to, con to continue my business here on this earth while I'm gone until I return. So let's pick it up in verse 12 right there. And this is kind of a long parable, by the way, but we'll read the whole thing. Uh, we're going to pick it up there in verse 12. And it says, He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We don't want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first one came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful in very little. You shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I have kept away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you. <clears throat> Because you are a severe man, you take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, Bring them here and slaughter them before me. Wow. There's a lot going on in that parable. I mean, we got a nobleman who's going to go away to become a king. And then we've got two different types of people that are here also. We've got the citizens and we've got his servants, of which, by the way, there's various subcategories of the different servants. So. 
there's a lot going on here. Now, as far as this nobleman going away to become the king, this seems odd to you and me, maybe to, to those of us who are allowed to elect our representatives. But in Jesus's first century audience, this, by the way, made perfect sense to them because basically Rome ruled the entire world and Rome appointed those people who were going to be in charge of different geographical areas. I mean, typically those that Rome appointed were from the nobility, the ruling class, you know, of those nations that they were conquering. But nonetheless, even if they were from the ruling class and noble people, Rome appointed and approved every single one of them who was going to be in charge. So if a person wanted to be king of an area, if they thought they had a right to be the king or whatever, they had to make the trek all the way to Rome and lobby for their own kingdom. So prior to his departure, the nobleman gave his servants money so that they can continue to engage in business until he returned. He didn't give them instructions to go out and increase his money. He just wanted them to continue conducting business on his behalf until he got back. You know, just maintain the status quo. That's all he asked of them. Go out, feed the livestock, plant the fields, do whatever it was that they did to make money. You see, he trusts these servants. There's no indication to the contrary that he doesn't trust his servants. Now, the citizens, on the other hand, they hate the nobleman and they don't want him to be their king. So, by the way, in that parable, what happened was once the king left to go get the kingdom, the citizens of that country, they sent a delegation to Rome also and said, hey, no, 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 no. We don't want this guy to be our king. They didn't want him. And they sent that delegation to do that. But the servants of his, they seemed to be content to, to serve him. To them, it didn't seem like he was that bad of a guy anything. So them and the citizens definitely did not agree with it because the citizens, by the way, again, they wanted nothing to do with him becoming the king. Well, obviously, Rome sees no validity in the charges that they make, and he returns and is the king of that area. So when he returns, he calls those people that he entrusted with Amina to see how have they fared since I've been gone. Remember, he never told them that he wanted them to, to increase his money. That was not what he told them to do. He just told them to engage in business until he recomes, until he comes. You see, Amina that he gave them, by the way, it wasn't really that much money. I mean, for them, it would have been about three months worth of their salary. But to him, it, it, it probably really wasn't that much. So what he expected his servants to do was not to necessarily make money on his behalf. He just expected his servants to continue doing business on his behalf. And this was, in a sense, by the way, kind of a test that he left them with because what he was really wanting to know is, are these servants of mine faithful? Are they faithful servants to do what I have asked them to do? Because by the way, I want you to consider this for a second. Being a servant of this king, it was not a very good proposition, by the way, because the citizens hated this guy. So they didn't want this guy to succeed in any way, shape, or form. And so therefore, if they didn't want the king to succeed in his kingdom, then it stands to reason that they didn't want to see his servants do well either. So for them to do business on behalf while he was gone, it, it probably didn't bode very well with them. You know, 
not only was it a risky proposition to do business on behalf of the king, but in that environment, it could have also been a deadly proposition for them. So these people to do, to do the business of that nobleman while he's gone, it was a risky, potentially deadly environment for them. So now they come before him, they come and they appear before him, by the way, and some of them did exceedingly well, and they're rewarded for their dedication to the king, and for their loyalty, they're given authority over other groups of people, you know, over cities and stuff, but they're given authority over other groups of people. They had accomplished what the nobleman asked them to do. They represented him well while he was gone. And actually, they increased his kingdom while they were gone. They passed the test, by the way. He could trust them with a little bit, so he gave them more and more so that he could trust them with more and more. But one of the servants comes before him, though. One of the servants comes before him, gives him back his mina. And the servant chastises the king and basically tells him that he doesn't trust him. And the king condemns that servant with his own words. And, and here's the thing. When we read that the king condemns him, see, for us, when we hear condemnation, I mean, we immediately think of death because that's what you're condemned to. And, and in our language, you know, you're condemned to death. But that's not what the king was talking about here. The king says, I'm going to condemn you with your own words. In other words, I'm going to use your own words against you to show you how foolish what you just said really is. And the king takes back his mina and he gives it to somebody else who's willing to use it and to increase his kingdom. But here's the thing. He didn't kick that servant out of his kingdom. He didn't seek retribution against that servant. He doesn't cast them out. Uh, he doesn't do anything like that. They remain a servant in his kingdom. It's just that they're not going to have authority over any of the others. They're just going to go about with the status quo. You know what? They're going to go work out in the fields. They're going to you know, take in the harvest. They're going to go out feeding the chickens. They're going to do, you know, whatever it is that the worker class does while these other servants were given authority, kind of kind of a promotion in, in a sense. So in this allegory, obviously, the servants represent followers of Christ, allegorically. In the story, the nobleman gives, the, gives all ten servants he gives them money. But, but Jesus only highlights three of them, by the way, that are called to give an account. And these, these three that he calls, by the way, typify the other seven as well. This pretty much is, you know, they all pretty much made money except for that last one. But here's what I want you to consider about the servants. I want you to consider this about all 10 of the servants. Each of the servants was given the same amount to conduct the nobleman's business while he was gone. None of them were at an advantage over any of the other ones. And as followers of Christ, as followers of Jesus, God has given every single one of us the same amount of raw material to work with as well. And we're going to talk about gifts and stuff here in a minute. But as far as raw material, God has given you the exact same that he's given me, the exact same that he's given everybody else. And what is that raw material that God has given us to work with? Lost souls. They're everywhere. There's tons of them out there. We're never going to run, you know, get we're, we're never going to run out of lost souls. And in this allegory, think about this. If the servants are to conduct business on behalf of the nobleman while he's gone, then that's what Jesus is teaching his disciples, including you and me and anybody else present that claims Christ as their Savior. And that's what they should be doing. And what is 
Jesus's business. Well, actually, Jesus had just shared what his mission was with this very audience that he's talking to right now. When he was at Zacchaeus's house, immediately before telling this parable, Jesus said to them, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's what his purpose for coming to earth was, was to seek and to save the lost. So if that's what our master came to do, and we are to continue conducting business on his behalf while he is gone, then what should each of us be doing? That's right. We should be seeking and sharing the gospel with other people on behalf for Christ while he is gone. Because, by the way, we can't actually save anybody, of course, ourselves. You know, we have to share the gospel with him. Jesus does the saving himself. So not only did Jesus teach it through this parable that he's teaching them that they should be conducting business on his behalf while he's gone, but the last thing that Jesus says before he ascends into heaven in Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. And by the way, Matthew wrote this. Matthew was standing there and heard, and this is what Jesus said to them. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, I know that some of you are sitting out there, some of you are listening online, and you're saying, yep, I got it. That's the Great Commission, and that's all good and everything, but I am not a preacher. That's not my gift to go out and to preach to people. I don't have the gift of gab. I'm not going to be out there speaking to everybody. I agree with you. That's not your gift. You don't have the gift of gab. But here's the thing. God gave all of us different personalities, and he gave every single one of us at least one gift. God gave you at least one gift, and he gave you the personality that you have, and you have experienced things in your life that I and other people have never experienced. I mean, think about it. I can never relate to another human being who has bore a child. It's never going to happen. I'm not going to be able to relate to that because I've never done it. I'm never going to do it. I can't tell you what it's like to drive a race car, Frank. But some of you do know how to. And there are other things in my life that you have experienced that I have no clue about. And I'm not going to be able to relate to other people about this. But here's the thing. God gave each of you your own special way to go out there and conduct the king's business. You don't have to be a preacher to conduct the king's business. I, ref- I remind you, what's the king's business? To seek and to save the lost. And you don't have to be a preacher to do that. Now, the other group, that was represented in this allegory are the citizens. And the citizens represent the citizens of this world. And the citizens, by the way, they hate the king and are opposed to his kingdom. Not only do they hate the king and his kingdom, but by the way, they hate everyone else that is associated with his kingdom. And Jesus taught that to his disciples as well. Listen to what he said in John 15. He said, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world, therefore this world hates you. This world and the citizens of it are opposed to the kingship of Jesus Christ. They refuse to submit themselves to him. 
And the parable, by the way, is quite clear what happens to the citizens who opposed the king. When he returned, they were slaughtered before him. When the king returns this time, coming up, could be today, could be tomorrow. We don't know when the king is going to return. But when the king returns, you only have two choices. By the way, and you're going to make your choice before he gets here. You only have two choices. Either you have submitted to him or you're against him. Now, the application to this parable, it depends, obviously, on the relationship that you have with Jesus. Have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you submitted yourself to him? Or are you just one of the citizens who, you know what? You don't necessarily oppose Jesus. You just haven't never submitted yourself to him by placing your faith in him. See, when the, when the king returns again, you're either for him or you're against him. You have a choice that you must make. And by the way, the default is, is that we're all against him because sin has separated us from him. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, he said, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. What choice have you made? If you've chosen Jesus and placed your faith in him, what kind of servant are you? There were 10 of them. Be honest with yourself. Are you conducting business on behalf of the king while he is gone? If Jesus returns today and calls you to give account for the mina that he's given you, what's that going to look like? What will your account be? Are you using what he has given you to increase his kingdom? Now listen, I... I want you to understand the consequence of what I'm talking about here, okay? I have, I have told you this verse many a times, and I'm going to tell it to you again today because I don't want you to misunderstand what we're talking about here. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So in this parable, even though Jesus called the one servant who did nothing with the mina a wicked servant, that wicked servant was not cast out. That wicked servant was not cast out into, you know, into an eternal hell. What you do with what God has given you, with your gift, is not going to determine your eternal future. Let me say that again because I don't want you to misunderstand this parable. What you choose to do with the gift that God has given you to continue business until he returns will not determine your eternal future. The Apostle Paul explains this in his first letter to the Corinthians when he says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And that fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that has been... that has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that Bema seat, 
the work that you have done since you became a new creation in Christ, it will be judged. And you'll find out whether it was silver or gold or precious stones and it will last. Or will your work be burnt up like wood, hay, and stubble? Are you building a kingdom here on earth? Are you building your kingdom here on earth? Are you building God's kingdom? Anything that you invest your time in that is not going to go into the eternal state with you is a waste of time. It's all wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to be burnt up. The trappings of this world are not going to go into the eternal state with you. But the gold, the silver, the precious stones, they're going to go with you. When you invest your time, when you invest your love, when you invest the treasure that God has given you here on this earth, those are the things that are going to stand the fire of the judgment seat of Christ. Those are the things that are going to last. So I just want to encourage you today. Two things. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, please understand that you will make a choice right now. You're going to make a choice right now. You're either going to choose to place your faith in Christ or you're going to choose to walk away from here again and not place your faith in Christ. But you're going to take that chance of standing before God's judgment alone without the shelter of Jesus Christ, without the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I ask you, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, please don't leave here today without us talking about that. Let me show you from the Bible how you can place your faith in Christ. If you're listening online, get a hold of me. Get a hold of somebody who knows how to show you from the Bible how to place your faith in Jesus Christ. If you've already accepted Jesus as your Savior, well, I want to encourage you to use the gifts that God has given you to conduct business for the king until he returns. He came to seek and to save the lost. Make that your business. Seeking and saving the lost. Make that your business. When you go to work tomorrow, make that your business. When you go to school tomorrow, make that your business. When you leave here today, when you go out to eat, when you go shopping, no matter what you do, make that your business. In everything that you do in life, make that your business. Seeking and saving the lost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do just want to thank you so much for, for your word, Lord. We thank you so much for these parables that, that we've studied and that we are studying, Lord, that, that we get Jesus' words teaching us what he expects from us, Lord, while he is gone. Father God, we just pray that, that we would see the, the spiritual side of each of these parables and not just the earthly side that, that people easily understood, Lord, but that we would understand the spiritual concepts being taught here. Father God, as we as we go out into that hurting and dying world, Lord, we know that there are plenty of lost souls out there. Father God, we see them every single day. Help us to accept that challenge and help us to understand that we're to be doing your business till the king returns. Father God, help us to be salt and light in this world till Jesus comes. Amen.